Ezekiel chapter number 16, beginning at verse number two. There we will find a scripture that mesmerizes us. The graphicness of the text is spellbinding. Verse two, son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abomination. And say, thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, thy birth and thy nat nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, hmm, in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut. Neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou was cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou was born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee when thou was in thy blood, Live. Somebody shall live. live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Can the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word? I want to talk from a very unusual subject, if you will allow me. Discussion, if you please. When survival, when surviving isn't safe. When surviving isn't safe. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. I thank you for what you're about to do in the midst of your people. I believe you for miracles unprecedented and unseen, unrealized. The intangible made touchable, the invisible made physical. Speak to us out of the volume of the book, great God that you are. I thank you in advance for what you're able to do. Ah, do whatever you want to do. Have your way, throw your weight around. Touch your people where they need to be touched, whether they're in the building or online, whether they're on the couch or laying in the bed, wherever you find faith, remember your people. I thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, say amen. amen. You may be seated. Yeah. Let's go for it. I never will remember, never will forget as a little boy at the bottom of the hill on the street, dead end street that I grew up on in the hills of West Virginia, my mother cautioning me not to go to a certain house. In fact, there was a sign out front that said TB. At that time, I date myself when I say this, tuberculosis was quite pervasive. And because we were not always allowed access into treatment centers or had insurances to go, we dealt with it at home with signs out front that said TB. And the tuberculosis was a crisis of mammoth proportions that killed lots and lots of people. But I survived it. Smallpox came along. There was a lot of debate, like we have debates now, we did then, about vaccines in school. And many, many people suffered damage, 
loss of vision, whatever I, I, I survived it. So did many of you. The day John F. Kennedy was riding down the streets of Texas and was shot in his head and Jackie was covered with blood, we wondered about the future of America. I survived it, so did you. Dr. King upstairs in the motel shot, bled to death, bled out and died. Right beside Andy Young and others standing all around him. For our community, it was devastation because he had succeeded in galvanizing most of us around a committed cause and not just us alone, but whites and Jews and others had finally begun to listen to him and at the opiate of his ministry, just shy of 40, a bullet ripped through his young flesh and took him away from the arms of his wife, Coretta, and, and his little girl who was just knee high, Bernice. And my teacher put her head down on her desk and cried, and so did I, but I survived it. Survive Woodstock. <laughs> I won't describe it, but I survived it. Survived the Vietnam War. Cassius Clay turning into Muhammad Ali locked in jail in protest to a war that now we realize he was right about. And all the chaos and the confusion that ensued and all of the cover-ups. And I survived it. Watergate. And everywhere you turn, without social media and without technology, Watergate was so pervasive that the other day I was put in that hotel and it made me nervous. <laughs> I didn't want to take a shower because Watergate, the stigma of the name, still lingers on Watergate, Nixon and the cover-ups and the scandals. Uh, we survived it. The war in Iraq, Afghanistan, long, silent war. By then, we'd become too sophisticated to show you the bodies like we did in Vietnam. And somehow, out of sight was out of mind, but that didn't mean that the bodies weren't flying home and the people weren't dying. It just said the finesse of the press had become so debonair that they no longer showed us that the cost of war was more than money. It was the sons and daughters of Americans whose tables remain empty. Though our headlines have moved on, they still grieve, but they survived it. Had moments in my personal life so devastating, I, I wondered if I would crawled through it. I remember at the height of my mother's illness and we were trying to build this sanctuary and rushing between the hospital and the church and preaching on the road and, and writing maximize the moment while she was dying. How ironic to write maximize the moment while somebody's dying. I remember driving home about three o'clock in the morning from the hospital and I drove down Fisher Road where I lived on White Rock Lake. And I thought, maybe if I just drive on into the lake, I won't know how this ends. Because I didn't think that I could take that level of grief. And I thought, I just won't know what happened but I survived it. <laughs> yeah. 
Survival is an important thing. I sat in the hospital room with one of our members whose son drowned in Joe Pool Lake and his corpse was laying in the bed and I sat in there for two and a half hours listening at the father scream and watching the boy's body grow colder and colder. And he kept asking me why. I just lost my mother and now my son is drowned and I have become too wise to answer life's questions. I no longer feel obligated to come up with simple, ridiculous answers to mammoth pain. Instead, I chose to tell him, don't worry about why. It may be eternity before you understand why. Focus on surviving it. Survive it any way you can. Pray, cry, scream, holler, yell, crawl, collapse, faint, get up, rinse, and repeat. But the only thing I ask you to do is when life hits you in the gut, survive. When they say you won't make it, <laughs> cry if you must, but survive. When they fire you and you don't know where you're going to get your next meal from, hold your head up, your back straight, and survive. I remember when they shut down the plant and we had two children and I walked across the parking lot trying to get all my tears out before I got home to you. And I didn't know how in the world I was gonna be able to feed my family. But I was determined to survive. If I had to dig ditches and I did, and if I had to cut grass and I did, and if I had to start a grass company, I did. But I survived. To be a survivor is an important thing. If I drop the mic, there's not a person in this room that doesn't have a story that they could tell about the hard places in their life. They had to survive. There are people in this room who have had cancer. They've had the terror of going in the doctor and listening at the doctor say, it's cancerous, the biopsy has come back positive and they wondered if they were going to die, but they... They survived. There are people in the room who've had bypass surgeries and, 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 and gone through surgeries so bad and swole up so bad and been sick so long that, that they didn't know that, that tomorrow would ever be there and, and they are here today and they have survived. There are people who have been cheated on, betrayed, heartbroken by people you love so much that your heart broke so bad that you thought you would die. But you didn't. you survive. There are people whose mother's days are not mother's days because your children don't treat you like other children treat their mothers. And you cried until you ran out of tears and then you survive. There are children who don't even know who their mother or father are and they've always felt different and always had a hole in their heart and an insecurity and a vulnerability, but they survive. Sometimes life offers you no option but to survive. You have no choice but to survive. 
at first you luxuriate in how you would like for it to be and how you want it to be and how you wish it would be. And then when it turns out differently, you're left in the abyss of survival. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. Survival instinct, it's the strongest instinct in the human spirit. That's right. That's right. We survive. We adapt, we adjust. The reason there is variance in the melanin of our skin is not a result of our DNA. No, no. No, no. It is the regions that our ancestors came from. It was the physical response to survival that caused our nose to grow wide so that the sandy terrains of the desert would not stop us from being able to breathe. that caused the melanin in our skin to grow dark so that we could reflect the glaring heat of the sun in a way that made us able to survive. That caused certain other cultures' eyes to be squint so that they could survive the terrains that they lived in, the blaring suns, the sandy dunes. Our bodies adjust to our environment because we were created to be survivors. In the text before us, it is, it is, it is a bit, can I just talk a little bit? It is a, a mosaic, as it were, of so many different things. It is perhaps one of the most horrific metaphorical descriptions that any prophet ever pronounced against any people. Uh, when you visualize the text, it is graphic, it is poignant. It is an R-rated scripture, not because of its sexual content, but because of the magnitude of the graphic depiction of blood and gut and bowel and birth suspended between life and death. God uses this graphic expression to have a conversation with his people, Israel, to talk to Jerusalem specifically about their birth. <laughs> it is not a lovely birth. It is not a glorious birth. It is not the birth like the baby on the Gerber bottles. It is not a birth. It's not even a, a birth like Jesus, uh, lowly, but in a manger, surrounded by a loving mother and father and, and lowing sheep and cattle. And yet it was a nativity scene. This is the, the, the nativity that nobody talks about it in the text, you will notice the word nativity points to the fact that this too was a nativity scene. Uh, no swaddling clothes, no mangers, no animals, no beasts. No, this is a nativity scene of depletion and rejection and turmoil. The, the definition of nativity, by the way, is not just birth, but the process of or circumstances of being born, the circumstances around the birth. Uh, uh, it, it predicts for us the scene and the setting of birth. Sometimes God births the greatest things in the worst places. Void of prenatal care and and, and love and touch. We are born in environments sometimes without touch or love or nurturing or supplements or kindness or affection. The warmth of a mother's breast, the supply of the milk from the breast nourishes the body but forever bonds the baby to the mother. None of that is there. When Mary stuck Jesus' mouth to her breast and fed his mouth her milk, she later would drink his. She sowed her milk, she reaped his milk. She did not know when she gave him her milk that he was the milk of the word. 
But that is not the nativity scene here. When, when Jesus was born, he was born in a manger. And, and, and at first for years, I thought that was an expression of his poverty, but really it was an expression of his identity because he was the Lamb of God. And as the Lamb of God, it is no accident that the Bible describes the shepherds in the field because a lamb was born. A lamb that would take away the sins of the world. And such was the nativity scene of Jesus, so, so lowly and yet so powerful. Uh, two diametrically opposed ideas. The, the barn suggests poverty, but the wise men suggest riches. It expresses the breath of God, who, who you cannot get so low that he cannot reach you. He is the God of the homeless, the helpless, the destitute, the rejected, the alienated, the despised. He is God enough to connect with the person that's listening at me right now who has no place to stay when the service is over. And you're in this building and you're surrounded by all of these people. But you know that when you go back, you go back to the shelter or back to the bridge or back to some little tent up under a, a wooden enclosed hidden factor where you wash in a plastic basin he's your God too and he came low enough that you wouldn't have to reach far to touch him he came into a manger within arms length of homeless people who sleep in barns and under bridges he came that low that is his nativity scene born in a manger wrapped in rags swaddling clothes used milk rags they wrapped the milk of the word in milk rags and and there he was in swaddling clothes laid in a manger in a lowly place so that so that rich people couldn't block you from having access to Jesus he 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 came he came where you were he came where you were i feel like preaching this morning he he came where you were and so that poverty does not become the emblem of Christianity, the wise men brought gold and frankincense and myrrh and acknowledged him as king. And he is born with gold and frankincense and myrrh. And he is born acknowledged as a king which is why Herod hated him in the first place because normally the goal would have gone to Herod but it went to Jesus meaning that they had bypassed the existing powers and acknowledged him as king of the Jews in a way that so threatened him that that Herod wanted to kill him, not because of his messianic value as savior of the world, but because he threatened to be the king of the Jews. So on one hand, we have a God so low that he's laying in hay in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes so that the most lowly amongst us who are uh, dealing with uh, pervasive times and times of destitution can still access him and yet he has brought gold and frankincense and myrrh as a king so that the highest amongst us cannot become so wealthy or so famous or so intellectual that we could escape our need of God. He's our God too. The old folks say it this way, he's so low, you can't get under him. He's so high, you can't get over him. <laughs> he's so wide, you can't get around him. You must come in. Uh, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I wanted to spend a moment on the nativity scene because juxtaposing one against the other becomes fascinating to me because on one, while he was surrounded in impoverished elements in one way, riches in another, he was not denied the maternal love of a mother and the care of a father, which is not the case in the text before us today because the real riches 
of a baby isn't gold or diamonds. What will a baby do with gold or diamonds anyway? And a baby really doesn't care how fancy the bassinet is, even though we spend all kinds of money to get all kinds of things and dress them in all kinds of clothes that they don't know it's Gucci. The, the, the baby doesn't know he's wearing East St. Laurent. That's why he throws up on it. He doesn't really care about that. <laughs> it would have been better to take the money and put it in a college fund and prepare for his future, but what the baby does know is that I am wrapped in love. I can hear my mama's heartbeat. I can feel my father stroke my head. And when I am around them, I am safe. Whether I am in the ghetto or whether I am in the penthouse, I am safe because I am surrounded by that which is intangible. I am surrounded by love. So when I step into this text today, I do not weep because there is no gold and I do not weep because there is no silver and I do not weep because there is no diamonds and I do not weep because there is no finery. I weep because there is no love. In this text, the nativity scene that is set before us stands in sharp contradiction to the nativity scenes that I'm accustomed to seeing. But this text is a picture of God expressing the abomination of Jerusalem. And very few times do we hear it preached in context. So I wanted to take just a moment with you to put the text in context before I take liberties with the text for which Ezekiel never meant. Ezekiel is pronouncing judgment on Jerusalem because Jerusalem has finally come to the promised land and forgotten its identity. And I talked last week for just a moment about how important identity was when I talked about my last name was Jakes and Jakes was German and I'm not German, which means I have no last name, which means I cannot fully point to a lineage without DNA. My name does not define my DNA. The two things do not match. And that is a cultural dysfunction that we have not studied the ramifications of because we have not deemed it important enough to provide Yale research to what happens to a people who not only lose their ancestors, but lose their identity. The problem in the text today deals with the people who have been wandering in the wilderness and they have come to Jerusalem and, and, and all of a sudden they have conquered the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Gerashites, they have conquered all of them and yet they have been affected by those they conquered. They have, they have conquered their country, but not their culture. And like their forefathers did in Egypt, they have assimilated into their environment to the, to the expense of the loss of their identity. And I thought it was important to share with you that when you are always adapting to the culture, little by little, you are eroding your own identity. The, the desperate need we have to fit in, to be accepted, and all that we do to send out signals to the culture that we are one of them means that we are none of us. Anytime being one of them becomes more important than being you, you do not recognize that their acceptance is creating the erosion of your own identity. <laughs> you know, if I were foolish enough to answer a question, I wore white shoes last Sunday and a lady asked me on Instagram, what's up with white two shoes? I started to answer and tell them I liked them. <laughs> That's why I wore them. I, did, I didn't wear them because you liked them. I didn't wear them to find out if you thought I looked good. I didn't wear them 
to see if it was okay. I didn't wear them because all the men in the church were wearing white shoes. I didn't wear them to fit in. I wore them because I liked them. I, I thought they looked nice and I wanted to wear them. And if you want to comment on it, it's okay. But just know that your comment doesn't matter. I still have them. I will wear them again because I am not worried about fitting in with the standards of an individual that I have never met. And if you knew how little I cared about what you thought, you would have saved this opportunity to say something that was significant because frankly, baby, I don't get a flip what you think about my shoes. You got to know who you are. And you got to know who you are even when other people protest your right to be unique and, and suggest that you have to live up to some unwritten standard that they have made for you to live by. I do me. I just do me. I just do me. I just do me. I don't have to be Fred Price. I don't have to be Kenneth Copeland. I don't have to be Cruffalo Dollar. I don't have to be Bishop McCullough. I don't have to be anybody else. God did not call me to be you. God called me to be me. You see, my brothers and sisters, the abomination in the text is that Jerusalem has taken the land, but they have lost themselves. <laughs> All of us know people who got a job and they changed them who moved in a position and they changed their voice and the voice inflection, they start talking funny and start acting like they didn't know you even though they knew you last week. But just because you got a pay raise, don't go crazy, baby. They may take it back next week and you might need some of the people that you walked away from. Don't burn the bridge just because you got a helicopter, you may be back on the bridge. Again, the abomination with Jerusalem is that they have allowed themselves to be sequestered, to be snatched away culturally from who they were. And, and when the Bible talks about how they were cast out into an open field, it reminds them that their association with the people that they're dealing with, it was their custom to take babies who were deformed or different or they couldn't afford and leave them in the wilderness to be devoured by animals. So when he says, I cast you, you were cast into an open field to the loathing of your person, it is reminiscent of the fact that the people that you are impressed with have as a tradition the removal of their babies to be devoured in the wilderness by animals because they were different. The loss of their identity has caused them to assimilate to the point that, that God is upset with them. And I believe that if he were to come today, he would be upset with the church. I believe he would be upset with the church because we are bent on living like, looking like, dressing like, walking like, singing like, performing like them when we were supposed to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and yet we are letting hip hop and the world and other people decide who we are and how we are, and we no longer think we're cool if we're different, and we have been captured by those we have captured. That is the substratum of this text today. Can I deal with the reality of the text? I don't hear anybody talking about what the text really means. 
and God is upset because he has found himself asking the same question he has in Genesis. Adam! I'm looking for you. Where are you? What happened to you? What, where have you? what have you come to that you have forgotten who you are? Have you mean you have endured so much pain that you're unrecognizable and you have turned in your nice for nasty? Where are you with your loving heart, with your giving heart, with your praying heart, with your worshiping heart, that you have imitated your sisters of, of heathen nations? And now you pride yourself on being cold. Where are you as men of God that you have turned into wimps? and are satisfied to marry women to replace your mama. You call her mama and you call your house a crib. I'm not gonna bother you. The, the, the text is gruesome and graphic and preachers as a whole spiritualize it rather than deal with it because if we deal with it in its graphic dimensions, the scene I see is horrific. I see a newborn baby and I've, I've been in the room when babies were born and when babies are born, they're not cute. Anybody who walks in the room and sees your newborn baby when it first comes out your body and says, oh, how cute, they lying. <laughs> they might be cute in a day or two. They might even be cute in an hour or two. But when they first come out, they are scary. They look like creatures from the Black Lagoon. They have all kind of different colored gook on them and sticky stuff on them. They look an absolute mess. They look like something only a mother could love. Now, a mother can love them. A mother can love them. But I look at them and say, oh. I love those nebulous statements that don't commit me to any particular decision. But a newborn baby doesn't look cute because birth is traumatic. Birth is traumatic and right after they get through crying, they fall asleep because birth is hard work and they are bruised in the birthing process and the mother is exhausted. They call it labor for a reason. It's a job to have a baby. Punch the clock when you go in the hospital because you're gonna be working because the doctors with all of their medicine and all their technology cannot push for you, cannot endure pain for you. And if you don't have an epidural, you're gonna experience the cause of childbirth in your own body and I think God meant for us to feel the pain so that we would stop giving our children to their grandparents to raise because they cost you enough that you wouldn't toss them around and throw them away so easily the fact that we have numbed the pain we have numbed the responsibility because when you get through something birthing something that hurts you you don't let nobody take your stuff from you. You don't let nobody take it when it hurts you. When you went through pain to get it, when you had to go through hell to get it, it changes the way you see it. This baby, this Jerusalem, this young country, I almost call the text the birth of a nation. It is the birth of a nation who were slaves and then sons, and now having possessed land, they become a very small baby nation, surrounded by bigger nations, with more high-tech equipment and more advancement. They were hated. Even though they were winners, they were hated. And even to this day, they are hated. Even to, if we go back to recent history to Adolf Hitler, they were hated. 
hated it in a way. Uh, I mean, we can't compare tragedy to tragedy, but we must admit that, that the trauma of being stripped naked, starved to death, and thrown into gas chambers is no walk in the park. What did they do to deserve being cast out into an open field to the loathing of your person. Now, let's not get it confused. This, this text does not deal with them being abused. It deals with them being neglected. It says nobody salted you, which was the custom in the day to heal the bruising and the trauma of what you've been through. Salt was how they got your skin to be subtle and to recover its normal texture so that it didn't look like where you came from. And I know you survived, but some of you survived, but you still have where you came from stuck to you. You made it out, but it's still on you. And God said, no, I pitied you. And no hand salted you. Because it is good, not God's will for you to look like what you've been through. The placenta has escaped the vagina. The baby has been born. But the afterbirth is still on the child. And I wanted to ask you this morning, are you still carrying afterbirth? I know you survived and I know you're alive, but are, is, is, is what you came through still clinging on you? And that's why you come to church. You don't come to church to dance. You don't come to church to run. You don't come to church to leap. You come to church that you might be cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. Cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. Cleanse, cleanse, cleanse. Cleanse morally, cleanse spiritually, cleanse from old habits, old addictions, old cravings, old things that are out of control in your life. Cleanse from your idolatrous attraction to being like one of them. You came to get enough word that you could stand in the cognizance of who you are with full awareness that I am enough whether you like me or not you came to be cleansed from your incessant need to be accepted by people who really don't matter they don't pay no bills they don't pay your rent they don't come to see you when you die and yet you're trying to impress people for likes on a post for friends on Facebook and I came to wake you up that you need to be salted and you need to be washed and you need to be cleansed because you have given too much importance to things that are not important and not enough attention to things that are important and this is an abomination unto the Lord that you have been birthed and thrown into an open field and no one cut your Cord. You are still connected to your past. You are still feeding off of your yesterday. You are still talking about what happened last year and five years ago and ten years ago. And how can you go forward when you're still connected with your cord? <laughs> Nursery people say, cut me loose, cut me loose. Cut me loose, cut me loose. Cut me loose, cut me loose, cut me loose. And if you won't cut me loose, I'll cut myself loose. If I have to be like an animal in the woods and gnaw through the cord that's holding me back to where I used to be, I got to get loose from what's holding me. I cannot let yesterday contaminate today. What used to be a blessing has become a curse. What used to feed me now restricts me and it's time to cut the cord. You got to know when it's over. You got to know when it's time to cut the cord. The, the umbilical cord was a blessing in one stage in your life, but it's a restriction at another stage in your life. 
Now that I can breathe on my own, now that I can eat on my own, I cut the cord. And that's why some people don't want you to get better because your dysfunction is their job security and they want to keep you bound up and chained so that they can be important too. But if won't nobody cut you loose, gnaw through the cord, chew through the cord, pull through the cord. I want every person that wants to be loose in this room to make some noise. I said make some noise. All right, we're going to be bold. We're going to be radical. We're going to get out of control in this place. We, I want you to know three people and tell them survival is not enough. It's not enough for me to survive. It's not enough for me to just make it through. It's not enough for me to still have this gook on me. It's not enough for me to not be salted and not be washed and not be cut. I'm tired of just surviving. I'm tired of just getting by. I'm tired of just going through the same old, same old every day. This is a reckoning. This is an awakening. This is a revolution. I'm ready to gnaw through some cords that held me back. I need 30 seconds of crazy praise in this place. What good is God giving me a new year if I'm still going to live in the old year? What good is it for me to see another decade if I'm still tied to the past decade? To all of you who won't forgive and won't forget and won't move on and won't go on in your life and you think you're strong because you're still angry and bitter, you're not strong, you're bound. You're alive, but you're bound. You're alive, but you're not free. You're alive, but you're living in restrictions. And I speak to you today in the name of Jesus that God God is not satisfied for you to be a survivor. He wants to get you to a safe place. And if you know I'm talking to you today, give him the highest praise you got. I want to make this practical so you can get it because if I stay metaphorical, you'll shout off it, but you won't get it. When I say gnaw through the cord, that means cut yourself from everything that reminds you of where you used to be. One of my pastors called me and told me that there was some disc jockey talking about me and saying something. I don't know what he said. And, and I told him, I said, I don't care what he said. And I don't need to hear what he said. And he said, I'm going to tell you who it is. And I said, I don't care who it is because he said all he said and it didn't affect anything in my life. And I refused to allow him to affect my life. You got to gnaw through the cord, the message and the messenger, the word that comes into your life to dress you into captivity to dealing with stuff that you declare to be over. When I say it's over, it's over, baby. When I say it's done, it's done. When I walk away, it's over. I get to choose what space I'm going to be in. My nativity, my environment. I get to control where I give birth. I'm not going to give birth in hate and anger and hostility and confusion. And I'm not going to be tricked into changing your mind being a substitute for birthing my baby what do I get if you change your mind what do I get if you start liking me I'm going to resist the temptation to make you my prize and birth what God put down inside of me somebody have this baby somebody go right into labor right now and birth this baby somebody's water ought to break in this room the water of praise and you ought to birth this baby in this room right now because survival is not enough. Survival is not enough. You've got to get yourself to safe. Somebody scream at the top of your voice, I want more! 
I'm not talking about more cars. I'm not talking about more houses. I'm not talking about more property. I'm talking about more liberty, more freedom, more creativity, more grace, more movement, more peace, more continuity. Somebody holler, I want more. I want more anointing. I want more unction. I want more victory. I want more power. I want more gifting in my spirit. Somebody holler, I want more. I want more encounters with God. I want more movings of the spirit. I want to be more intoxicated with the Holy Ghost. I want to get in my car drunk in the Holy Ghost. I want to drive down the road talking in tongues. I want to get a word of knowledge how to raise my child. I want to get a word of wisdom how to stay in my marriage. Somebody throw your hands up and say, I want more. So get this mud off of me and get this muck off of me and get this gunk off of me because I have decided that surviving isn't safe. At no point in this text is the baby dead. The baby is not dead, but it is dying. Dead, no, but dying. If it does nothing, it will die. All you have to do to die is do nothing. If you do nothing, dying is easy. Let's, let's compare it to climbing a tree. Climbing a tree takes effort. Falling out the tree takes none. Climbing a tree takes skill and planning and looking at where the branches are. Falling is easy. If you decide you're gonna fall, all you gotta do is let go and immediately you're going to come down. But there are some of us who have made up our mind in this room. I've been through too much to get to this point in my life and fall down. I'm going to climb with intention. I'm going to climb with strategy. I'm going to climb with tenacity. I'm going to climb to the place that God has called me to climb. And if you don't want to climb, please get out of my way. Move, step aside, step over, collapse, faint, play dead out step over you whatever we got to do to go on down the road because I'm running out of time and I want to see the glory of God manifest in my life and I don't have 20 years to wait to see it happen I want it now somebody scream I want it now the worst thing in the text declare sit with me just a minute the worst thing in the text is where it says that the baby was sitting in his own blood. What a putrid image to be sitting in your own blood. To be sitting in what ought to be sitting in you. If the blood was in you, it would be life. But if you sit in it, it is death. And you are sitting in your own blood. I'm gonna go real deep. When you see the putridness of sitting in your own blood, you say, I would never do that. But when you sit in your own memories, When you sit in your own trauma, when you rehearse negativity over and over again, when you remind yourself of every painful thing that ever happened in your life, it doesn't matter what you wear, it doesn't matter what you buy, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter how big the house you get in, if you're still gonna sit in your own blood. You can have indoor jacuzzis and indoor pools and you can have the ceiling open up so you can see the open heavens, but if you're gonna sit in your own blood, you should have stayed in a trailer, in a park, and lived in the trash, cause you're sitting in your own blood. And I don't care what you say to me, I know for a fact that there are people
people in this room that are sitting in their own blood. Sitting is to make yourself comfortable. Sitting is to recline and relax. Sitting is a position of ease and comfortability. If you can comfortably sit in filth, if you can comfortably sit in negative thoughts and negative attitudes and become so comfortable sitting in your own blood that when somebody tries to raise you, you reject them. And when somebody tries to raise you, you don't want them. And when somebody tries to lift you, you say, I don't know, he's cool, but I don't, I just I don't like him. You don't like me because I won't sit with you. I'm not going to sit in your own blood. Hallelujah. And I want all the people that's been rejected to stop feeling sorry for yourself. People don't always reject you because you're not worth something. They reject you because they're comfortable in their own blood and you disrupted their comfortability and stopped feeling bad about yourself because they weren't willing to get out of their own blood. But there's some people in this room this morning that are going to escape their blood. I don't care what it takes. I refuse to sit in it. It happened but I'm not going to sit in it. I was raped but I'm not going to sit in it. My mother never loved me but I'm not going to sit in it. My father beat me like I was an animal but I'm a grown man and I'm not going to sit in it. I refuse to sit in my own blood. I'm going to rise above the trauma of what I went through and become the best version of myself I can be because I refuse to sit in my own blood. Somebody shout me down in this place. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I feel the Spirit of God in this place. I'm not going to sit in it. I'm not going to sit in it. I'm not going to sit in it. Somebody said, I'm not going to sit in it. 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 I've been divorced, but I'm not going to sit in it. I've been depressed, but I'm not going to sit in it. I've been through help, but I'm not going to sit in it. I had to be a therapist, but I'm not going to sit in it. They had to put me up, but I'm not going to sit in it. I had to take meds, but I'm not going to sit in it. I'm on a kidney dialysis, but I'm not going to sit in my own blood. Whatever I got left, I'm going to lift it up. Whatever I got left, I'm going to take it to the next level. Whatever I got left, I'm going to take it to a new height. I refuse to sit here and die in my own blood. Open up your mouth and give God a crave. I dare you to praise him. I dare you to praise him until hell gets nervous. Praise him until demons tremble. Praise him until you feel strength coming back. Praise him until you feel the glory of the Lord coming in your life. Praise him until witches back up. Praise him till you feel the power of God resurrecting himself in your spirit. If you determine to get out of the blood, Give me a crazy praise, a praise that takes you up, a praise that takes you out, a praise that takes you over. I can't hear you. I mean a praise that I'm going to get up this year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I dare you to praise him. I, I double dog dare you to praise him. I dare you to praise him like you got a made up mind. There is a better life. There is a place for me. And if the Canaanites don't like me and the Jebusites don't like me, I like me. I will arise. God likes me. God's got a plan for my life. I will get up get up in the balcony get up in the pulpit get up in the congregation get up in your living room get up in your situation God said get up lift your voice and give a shout to God
And so the Bible says that your father was a Canaanite and your mother was a Hittite. And it's a description of the influence that has intoxicated and enumerated Jerusalem from recognizing who they really are. But the Bible said God still passed over you. When I read it, I thought, Lord, this is the second Passover. We often preach about the first Passover. And the Bible said in the first one, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the Bible says that when he passed over this time, he still saw the blood. But it was not the blood of the Lamb. It was the blood of your past. And when God passed over the blood of your past, he made up in his mind, I'm going to speak one word. I'm going to speak it over your life. And if I speak one word, I want you to come out of this. I'm going to speak one word. Somebody say one word. Speak the word only and my son shall live. I'm going to speak one word. Somebody say one word. Speak to Lazarus and he's going to come out of the grave. Somebody say one word. One word will pull you out of poverty. One word will pull you out of depression. One word will pull you out of fear. One word will pull you out of procrastination. One word will wake you up. God said one word over your life. Live. I don't care what you're going through, he said live. I don't care what happened to you, he said live. I don't care what they say about you, he said live. Open your mouth and shout live. Shout live your gums tremble shall live till your liver quivers shall live till your feet start jumping shall live till you feel power standing up in you God said live God said live God said live Well, Bishop, I had a good life, and I'm 80 years old, and you know how life is. It is what it is. I don't know what you're talking about. God said live. If you're on a kidney machine, God said live. If you've been diagnosed with cancer, God said live. If you're HIV positive, God said live. If the doctor's done all they can do, God said live. If you only got three weeks, God said live. If you only got two friends, God said live. If you're living in a house by yourself, God said live. If you have to hug yourself, God said live. If you have to take yourself out to dinner, God said live. Whatever state you're in, what did God say? 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 Shout out of your mouth. So as I come to a close of this message, everyone standing. Everybody's already standing.
surviving isn't safe. If I gotta sit in blood, it's not safe. If I have to carry what I've been through on me, it's not safe. If I carry what I've been through naturally, it will turn around and make me sick and infect me. You shout because you survived, but surviving isn't safe. You survived for a reason. You survive for a reason. Wait, 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 let me make it plain. You do not survive to survive. I don't know how to make it any plainer than that. You don't survive to survive. I want to free you from survivor's guilt. Because you made it and somebody you love didn't. And you keep saying it should have been me. If it should have been you, it would have been you. Stop carrying around false guilt over divine providence. My God. If God would have called you, you'd be gone. There's a reason you're still here. Listen to this real good. Any people who have been oppressed for a prolonged time in anything, whether you've been abducted, whether you have been through rape and abuse, whether you have been through a terrible history, a terrible relationship, an abusive job, survival starts to look like success. And you stop wanting better. You become content just to survive. And I understand the trauma you have been through has made you delusional to think that survival is success. Survival only is only transportation to success. You survive for a reason. You survive for a purpose. You made it out of the hospital for a reason. You made it out of the psych ward for a reason. You made it out of your trauma for a reason. And if you just get here and say, I survived, that's not safe. So we got to wash off some afterbirth. We got to salt away some bruises and get our skin subtle because some of us have grown hard through the birthing process. The push was so hard. That ain't nothing but the sound of somebody getting delivered. That's the way church is supposed to sound. That's the way church is supposed to sound. When a soul sets free, it snaps free. It snaps free. 
she's not the only one in here there are hundreds and hundreds of people in this room that God is snapping free from the bondages of your past God is snapping you free and you can't wait on everybody to agree. Did you hear my message? Go for yourself. Get out of order. Get out of control. And thank God he's snapping you free. It's not safe to get healed and not be whole. The one man returns back to Jesus because he understands that being healed is not enough. In the arms of the priest, he is healed. But in the presence of Jesus, he is whole. If you ever get in the presence of God, you will never want to leave this place. If you ever get in the presence of God, you will never want to leave this place. God is saying live to you. All online, all on the internet, all across the waters, all across the sea, God said live. Surviving isn't safe. God said live. I know you've been hurt, but God said live. I know you've seen some painful days, but God said live. I have too. I have two, but God said live. God said live. God said live. God said live. And I have learned that I have to be intentional about living. It don't seem like it would be this way. It seems like living would be normal. Go ahead and do you. It seems like it would be normal to live. But when you have been traumatized, normal isn't normal. You have to be intentional. You have to look at some people's number on the phone and say, no, I'm not answering that. No, no, I'm not answering that. I'm not gonna let that afterbirth get on me today. I'm not up for that today. I'm not up for that today. I'm not up for that today. I'm not, I'm not going to respond to that. I'm not going to flow in that rain. Because this, this living thing, I got to work on it. I got to practice being happy. I got to practice having peace. I got to practice being present. I got to practice being content. I, I am so much either living in the past or concerned about the future that I'm ignoring the present. And if you ignore the present long enough, you will lose the present, reaching for the future. And what good is the future if you've lost the present? Surviving isn't safe. The Canaanites or the Hittites, I can't remember which one, threw every broken baby out into the desert to be devoured by animals because something was wrong with it. But Jesus said to babies who have something wrong with them, I won't throw you in the desert. I call you to me. And I will not set you up to die and things you can't wash off. I passed by you and I said live. And even though Jerusalem was small compared to its enemies, even though Jerusalem has been attacked continually and unrelentingly, it has survived. 
there will be many attacks. That's what life is. And being a Christian doesn't exempt you from life. But Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. This is the will of God for you people. Jesus says the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Going to church don't give you life. Singing in the choir don't give you life. Dancing and jumping because the music's good don't give you life. Life comes from a vibrant, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I want that life. To a degree, I have that life, but to a degree, I'm still seeking that life. God said to Samuel when he found David, I found a man that's after my heart. He wasn't talking about David being perfect. David proved that he wasn't perfect. God said, I found a man that's chasing me. He's after my heart. He's wooing me. He's courting me. He's dating me. He's longing for me. He's craving for me. He's after me. He's singing me songs. He's writing me poetry. He's dancing on the mountaintops in the early morning dew. I tell you, this dude is some kind of special. He's making up songs. He's killing his lions and his bears and writing his poetry and courting me like I'm his chick on the side. He's after me. He's He's wooing me. He's blowing me kisses. And I am going to promote him because he's a God chaser. Now, I know there's a lot of reasons to come to church. There's some cute girls in this church. There's some great business partners in this church. People come to church for all kinds of reasons, all kinds of reasons, all kinds of reasons. But out of the crowd of this room, there are some people who are tired of sitting in their own blood. It's tired of smelling their afterbirth. Tired of having fits of rage and mood swings because of the trauma of your past. There are some people in this room who have been literally sitting in your own blood you have told the same story over and over and over and over again and over again about what happened to you and what they did and how they treated to you. You're sitting in your own blood. It's tormented you. It's making you sick. If you sit in blood, it'll make you sick. The same thing that gave you life on the inside gives you death on the outside. It's a pool of infection. It attracts diseases. It'll tear up your family. It'll kill your marriage. It'll pollute your ministry. It'll disturb your mind. All you got to do is sit in it. I want a thousand people who make up your mind this day I will not sit in that blood another day to rush this altar. I want people online to call the prayer lines. I'm tired of sitting in my own blood. I'm not just going to be a survivor. I'm going to get to safe. I'm going to get to safe. I'm going to get to safe. Surviving isn't safe. Surviving isn't safe. 
Surviving isn't safe. It's not safe for me. It's not safe for my mind. It's not safe for my emotions. It's not safe for my well-being. It's not safe for my mentality. It's not safe. It's not safe for me to live my life the way I lived my life. It's not safe. It's toxic. It's dangerous. It's detrimental. I don't have a drinking problem. I got a sitting in blood problem. I don't have a drug problem, I got a sitting in blood problem. I don't have a relationship problem, I got a sitting in blood problem. But God passed by me today. God passed by me this Sunday morning at the potter's house and he said live. God passed by me and he said live. God passed by me and he said live. Whether I got a job or don't have a job, God said live. Whether I got money or no money, God said live. Whether I live in a house on the hill or a barn at the bottom, God said live. And I need to learn how to live.